We'll be reading from the book of Isaiah, the prophet. We are in chapter 48 today. Isaiah, the prophet, 48 chapter, from the beginning. We'll be reading from the New King James Version, with the grace of God. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, and have come forth from the wellsprings of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth or in righteousness. For they call themselves after the holy city, and lean on the God of Israel. And the Lord of hosts is his name. I have declared the former things from the beginning, they went forth from my mouth, and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them, and they came to pass, because I knew that you were obstinate, and your neck was an iron sinew, and your bro, bro bronze. Even from the beginning I have declared it to you, before it came to pass I proclaimed it to you, lest you should say, My idol has done them, and my carved image and my molded image have commanded them. You have heard. See all these things, and will you not declare it? I have, made you, I have made you hear new things from this time, even hidden things that you did not know them. They are created now and not from the beginning, and before the days you have not heard them, lest you should say, Of course I knew them. Surely you did not hear, surely you did not know. Surely you, for long ago your ears was not opened. For I knew that you would deal very treacherously, and were called a transgressor from the womb. For my name's sake I will defer my anger, and for my praise I will restrain it from you, so that I do not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I will not do it. For how should my name be profaned, and I will not give my glory to another? Listen to me, O Jacob, in Israel my cult. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. All of you assemble yourselves and hear. Whom among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him, I have brought him, and his way will prosper. Come near to me. Hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his Spirit have sent to me. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments, then your peace would, be, would have been like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants also would have been like the sand, and the offspring of your body like the grains of sand. His name would not have been cut off, nor destroyed from before me. Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing, declare, proclaim this, utter it to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. And they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. And he also split the rock and the waters gushed out. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Amen. God has a message, dear brethren, for the people of Israel who is found exiled there in the land of the Chaldeans, where accordingly to his will and his plan, they built, they fixed houses, they had children, they prospered, they had well-being, and at every danger that, that it arrived, God had his plan of salvation prepared through Daniel, as it is written in the word of God many times through the three young men, the Lord never abandoned or left the people of Israel. He exiled them. He 
set them captive because he wanted to clean them, he wanted to make them elect in the furnace of affliction. But <clears throat> after the trial, freedom comes. I read it again. Af I say it again. After the trial, after the exile, after captivity, deliverance comes. For example, Joseph went through a great affliction and suffering and trial, Joseph, when God used the disrespectful brothers of his so that they can sell him to Egypt, but nothing happened that God did not permit. And there is, dear brethren, a nice message from God in the scripture. God uses and the respectful for his will, and the unrespectful for his own will, for favor of his people. The Pharaoh of Joseph, he used them for the blessing of Joseph. And the Pharaoh of Egypt, even, he used them for the blessing of Israel. And Nebuchadnezzar, he used them for the blessing of Israel and Daniel and Cyrus. In other words, everything works for the better to the ones who love God. Never say inside you, send them away from me, Lord, throw a lightning bolt on his head through this man, any man, either he is good and respectful, either he, is, he has a good heart towards you, either he has a bad intentions towards you, either he is harsh, either tender, if you stand and remain in the will of God, then the result will be for blessing to come in your life. And God, dear brethren, reveals, informs by saying, I am the Lord your God, who teach you for your benefit, for your profit, and I lead you by the way you should go. My teaching is for your profit, and many times the teaching of Christ is harsh. Harsh is the word they said to Christ once. Who can hear this? Who can bear it? Other times the disciples said when he was teaching them about how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, then they said, who will enter? When he told them that from the beginning it is written that one man will get married with one woman, the disciples said, then it's not, it's not profitable for us to get married. Many times the word of God is harsh in the ears of men and especially in the heart of men. But God, dear brethren, informs us with all certainty that our, my teaching is to profit you. And you will be blessed if you, you would have been blessed if you walked in the way that I taught you, the way that I revealed to you, the way that I led you, which you should have gone through. But many times this way that God leads us is not the best. It's not the most pleasing. It's not the most easy. Probably it's the opposite. It's not the wide gate and the broad way that Christ leads us in. But on the contrary, through the narrow gate and the difficult way, Christ leads us for our profit. So, oh, that you had heeded my teaching and that you had heard my directions. Then your peace would have been like a river. And the peace, dear brethren, of Christ in our heart has complete relation with the happy life of a Christian. The Christian, the happy Christian, has peace. He waits for the Lord. Turmoil is that which brings misery to man, anxiety, fear. And in the end he says, he says peace is not for the wicked, he says in the end. So, respect towards God or disrespect towards God has to do immediately and completely with the acceptance of the will of God in your life. If, you, if I accept the will of God in my life, exactly as the Lord teaches me 
And exactly as the Lord guides me in His way, then we considered we are considered in the eyes of God respectful. So this results to having a blessed and happy, peaceful life. But if I do not accept the will of God, if I do not accept the guidance of the Holy Spirit, it burdens me, the Word of God burdens me, I consider it a great and heavy burden, that which God says to me, then I enroll myself, enlist myself in the disrespectful people, and I lose the peace that only Christ gives. And dear brethren, the peace that Christ gives to us does not depend from our environment. It doesn't, you don't have peace in your heart. If in your environment, peace reigns. You have in your heart peace when in your heart Christ reigns. Maybe outside there will be wars, battles, sorrows, afflictions. But the man who has taken the decision to trust his Lord, to follow the guidance and the ruling and management of the Holy Spirit and to obey completely though into the will of God and the Word of God, then the peace of Christ reigns in the heart of this man and immediately after peace, the good results come. Your righteousness will be like the waves of the sea. We won't sink. They won't, your righteousness will not be lost. They will float like the waves of the sea. And your descendants will be like the sand. A multitude of blessings in your life from your descendants. And I point it out once more, dear brethren, because these, day God, these days God has placed deep into my heart this thing. Only when we are completely united with the Lord, as Caleb and Joshua, will we enjoy the promises and the blessings of God. Completely united with the Lord. Which means completely upon the Word of God and in the will of God. If, if nothing else, then at least our intention should be this. No yielding. No giving up. Exactly what the Gospel says. Complete guidance of the Holy Spirit. And be careful. Not with a revelation, with a dream or a prophecy. From the mouth of two or three witnesses, the Word of God says that every word is assured, is certified. Because prophecies and dreams are so we can discern them first. N to call upon the certainty of God and to obey the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the end. So God now finds himself, dear brethren, and he has to face a very difficult problem with the people of Israel. There in Babylon, they're having a good time. But he did not send them to Babylon so they can stay there. He sent them there so they can return. The country of the people of Israel is the land of promise for them. And now they must come out with their will, by their will. They must abandon Babylon by, with their own will. It must be their decision. God guarantees all the abilities and possibilities to the man who wants to do his will so that he can do his will. But in the will of man, God cannot intervene catalytically, but only by pleading, by only by teaching, but only by guiding. If you want to do the will of God, then He will give you the ability. He will find a way. He will give you power. You will find grace. If you do not, then you will never be able. Not because God doesn't want to open a way for you, but because you will not take this decision to start and walk in the way that God has carved for you. And God comes now with a helper and says, Remember how you came out of Egypt and the desert. You never thirst. 
But I water from the rock that followed you, I gave to you in abundance. You weren't hungry, I threw manna from heaven down upon you. The obstacles were brought down by me. The Red Sea, I parted it so you can pass by, so you can pass through. The river Jordan, I cut it so you can enter the land of promise. If now you hear me, then I have chosen Cyrus, my beloved, who will create for you the conditions so you can walk on my will and so you can return. So come out from Babylon. And this come forth from Babylon, dear brethren, is valid always. As, just as the word of God is valid always. It refers to the man who has a harsh neck, as we are all. And God cannot trust us, because He knows that man falls very easily. Very easily he slips away. Very easily he loses his way. Very easily he goes astray from God. For that reason, that which God strives to do in our life, and in the life of His people always, and in the personal life, is to convince us. Because He cannot force us. He respects our complete freedom as He demands from us to respect the complete freedom of other men. Never will God force you. But always He will try with patience to convince you. He knows the nature of man. He knows the weaknesses of man. He knows the mistakes of man. He knows the power of the enemy. He knows that man can be deceived very easily. And he tries to convince him by showing him, first of all, who he is. So you heard, so hear you, those who have the name of Israel, and who are descendants of Judah, and you swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel. But I know that you do all these things not in truth nor in righteousness. And I say, Dear Lord, are we there? Are we in the not in truth? And let it not say us, but I, not in truth or in righteousness. Not in truth, which means I just a bit left, just a bit to the right, astray from the Word of God, and not in righteousness, just a bit outside the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He loves me, He loves you, He loves us. But are we inside? Dear brethren, how much we must examine ourselves. We must examine ourselves always. And it says, call upon always the will of God that is good and and pleasing to God. So if today God asks you, are you my child in my will? Could we ever state with boldness, yes. Difficult. Very difficult. Who could ever say and have this boldness to say, yes, I am Lord. Are you? And if you're not, do you want to be? This is more easy. That we can say, and He gives us this ability. Because if we consider from the morning how we walked before Him, then we will see how many times we slipped away from the truth of the Gospel and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter how much, a bit or a lot. And if we slip away and we do not give importance, then the consequences are serious. But if we slip away with fear of God and we are saddened and cry and mourn and repent, then the consequences will be very good. For that reason, God doesn't accuse the people of Israel. He reveals to them their heart. He reveals to them their life. He reveals to them their weakness. He reveals to them their problems. 
And he says to them, You have the name, and the name you have taken by my holy city. And you lean on the name of God of Israel, and his name is Lord of hosts. So learn today that I have declared the former things from the beginning. And when man enters the church of Christ, immediately God will visit him by prophecy. He will visit him by revelation, by manifestation. God starts cooperating with man, starts communicating with man. From the beginning, yes, from the beginning. I am with you. I exhort you. I rebuke you. I urge you. I promise you. Can you testify this? And you've heard it, and you've seen it. And we are witnesses, dear brethren. We are witnesses. That God was always with us. That He never abandoned us. He never gave up on us. And when each of us testifies his own story, then we remember how many things God has done in our lives. Can you testify this? Can you declare it? And we do. Now, he says... I have to say to you many more. Now new things I have for you, not the past. New things I will do in your life. Things that you have not seen, that you have not known, nor from long ago your ears were opened. And you know, dear brethren, every day God prepares new things in our life. He doesn't bring back the past, the former things. He brings new things, new guidance, new directions, new experiences. For that reason, the life of a Christian isn't I became a Christian and it's over. The life of a Christian is I am a Christian and I'm going on. I do, we do not hope and do, we do not boast on our past. We glorify God for our past. We forget our past, as Apostle Paul says that, I forget the past. But what Apostle Paul cares about is, I stretch out to the, for, to the things to come, to the presence of God. So stretching out to the things to come, I run, I might receive the prize of the upper calling. Our life is a race. Our life is a struggle. It's a try. You struggle always to enter through the narrow gate. Always. Always in front of you, you will have the wide and broad, the wide gate and the broad way, but at the same time, always in front of you, you will have a narrow and difficult way, which always you must choose. Or at least to have the intention always to choose it and to ask for the grace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. New things I will do. And these things that I am going to do have a purpose, have a target. I have a purpose for you. First of all, I want to clean you, not like silver. And I thought, how is silver cleaned? And you know how it's cleaned. As silver is destroyed, it says in the Greek, in the midst of a furnace, so shall you be destroyed in its midst. Silver is destroyed. It self-destroys when it is cleaned in the furnace. But God doesn't want to destroy us. He wants to clean us. I didn't clean you, he says, as silver, but as gold. Gold that isn't destroyed, it melts, but it's not destroyed. And I cleaned you, and I made you, and I tested you in the furnace of affliction. So, dear brethren, the new things that God prophesies are always our cleanness. Always the abstraction of, ru of rust in our heart, of sin, of transgression, of iniquity. God wants His people to be holy. Holy, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. And the sorrow and affliction, and many times the Lord uh, permits in our life, not many times, always, it is when you enter into different temptations, have patience. Because you are in need of patience. 
so you can do the will of God. Have patience and let your patience have a perfect work. You cannot have patience when you have joy. It's not necessary. You say more, Lord. When you have blessing, it's not necessary. I want more blessing, you say then. But when sorrow comes, when unease comes, when anxiety, not tor turmoil, because the believer doesn't have turmoil, the unbeliever and wicked has turmoil. The believer has hope. Along with the temptation, the Lord will deliver. And after the trial, blessing will come. And after the clouds and the black the clouds, again, the Son of Righteousness will rise. But that which God permits, He permits it so I can become even holier. Help me, Lord, so quickly I can become more holy. Not deliver me. Help me, Lord, so that which you have appointed for me, that which you had planned for me through this affliction to come out exactly as you want it to. Remember, dear brethren, when the persecution started in the first apostolic church, the disciples of that church, I don't know if we could ever do such, such a prayer, but the disciples of that prayer, of that church, prayed, not so Christ can free them from the persecution, but on the contrary, so God can give them boldness, so they can preach the gospel with greater power. They had understood that afflictions isn't a curse. Trials are not a curse by God. But they are a pre-step of blessing. Because sorrow will bring you into humility, humility and humility proceeds glory. But if this sorrow brings you to unbelief, that is what God fears. Do not be discouraged with acknowledgement that this trial, this sorrow, this, this muteness of God, He doesn't answer me. And how many times do we pray in our sorrow and he never get, we never get an answer? We say, do you exist? That is what God fears. Aren't you listening? That is what God fears. Or don't you care about me? That is what God fears. That is what He tries to convince His people by saying, You neither, surely you did not hear, surely you did not know, surely from long ago your ear was not open, for I knew that you would deal very treacherously and you were called a transgressor from the womb. God knows that man, if he is not helped, if he is not assisted by revelations, by interventions, by actions of God, by his nature, he is an unbeliever and a transgressor. So that's why he speaks about the things to come. So that's why he reminds the former things. Did I ever abandon you, my child? Did I ever give up on you? Wasn't I always with you? Didn't I heal you? Didn't I speak to you? Didn't I bless you? Didn't I give new birth to you? Didn't I baptize you in the Holy Spirit? Hallelujah. Now why are you discouraged? It is necessary, dear brethren, for us to believe in the Word of God. And the Word of God says that I will never leave you nor abandon you all the days of your life until the end of the age. I will never abandon you. And He says to Jerusalem, Jerusalem says, Lord, you forgot me. Lord, you do not hear me. And I say, forgive me, Lord. How long are you praying for? A day? So long. A whole week? So long. A month? For so long you've been praying. A year? So long. How long have you been praying for? Just compare the hours of your affliction with the years of eternity and see how few the things that God asks from you are compared to the things that He is about to give you. Just think of it. Just consider it. What does God ask from you? In a whole lifetime, if He asked from you, he is, it is so small compared to to that which He is going to give to you. He will give out to you. Even though 
Never, dear brethren, does he ask from man a whole life, just a few moments of faith and devotion. That is what God wants from us, so that he can open the waterfalls of heaven. He says, try me. Try me in your faith. Try me in your prayer. Try me by offering me your heart. And I will open the waterfalls of heaven. And I will pour out so much blessing upon you that you will not be able, you will not have a place to, to place it. And I saw a sister that is really afflicted and she prays and she receives no answer and I was praying and I received no answer for her and today I prayed and the Lord said to me tell her that the Lord will settle everything you know how much joy my heart flooded with but she, he never said when at that moment I said when Lord nothing no answer not a word he didn't tell me when is it worth it for us to wait, brethren? What's the other choice for us to leave? And what will happen then? Nothing, ever. Never will order come again in our life. Never will blessing come. Never will the grace of Christ come. Never will you know what it means the Lord will settle everything. So it is worth it, brethren. And inside the furnace of affliction let us hope on the Lord and let us say Lord a short time more yes a short time more a short time longer yes a short time to go how long as much as it's necessary amen Lord you know though brethren how when you're on the outside how easily you speak about the people who are in the furnace the sermons when you are outside are very easy there where the sermons becomes difficult is when you are in the furnace. Then. But glory be to God. Because when you are inside, quickly you come out with the grace of Christ. So that which God wants from us, brethren, is to convince us. Do not fear, only believe. Do not fear. I will not abandon you. I will never leave you. Lord, you forgot me. Is it possible for the mother to forget her suckling child? What do you think? Have you ever seen a mother that after, immediately after she gives birth, because when it grows up, she may forget the child. But from my daughters, I see, and from my wife, that immediately when she gives birth, she doesn't forget it. They suckle it. I see something's happening inside them. Something's going on here. When my son Dinos had risen, we had gone to the beach. We had left the child in the carriage. We got into the car and left. We forgot <laughs> the kid and the carriage on the street. Then we ran back and got him. It was, it's one of my childs. I don't remember who was it exactly. We came back quickly. I remember another time in church we were. We got into the car. We left and we had left our daughter at church. And the brethren took, took her and brought, us home, brought her home. Another time, we were in church, two sisters came, of uh, a brother of ours, and said, Brother, brother, what happened, my, ch my children? What's going on? Our father forgot us, they said. And I was laughing. Glory be to God. Don't be afraid, we'll go together, I said. And when we got there, they hadn't realized they had forgotten their children. But the suckling baby, you cannot forget. The small baby that breastfeeds, you cannot forget. The infant, you cannot. You see, dear brethren, how true the Word of God is. It is true, completely true. So immediately when she gave birth, immediately when you come out of the hospital, I remember when my son was born, I said, now what are we going to do with it? I'd look at it. I never had grabbed the child in my hands. It was a small, plump child. I looked at it, and she said to me, what are we going to do now? I said, I don't know. What are we going to do with this child? Is it possible for the woman to forsake her infant? And God says, even if they forget it, 
I will never forsake you. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? That Christ will never forget you. He has many jobs to do. But all His jobs are you. All His interest is in me. Is in you. But be careful. Not only me. And me. And you. And you. And you. He is present everywhere. If we had eyes to see Him, you'd see Him here next to me. And there. And there. And there. Everywhere. We thank God. He's not a saint, as people say. He's not a man who God sent. But He is God Himself, who became man, and He never ceased being God. He doesn't forget us. He doesn't forsake you. And many times, dear brethren, the waves are huge. They're heavy. They're powerful, tall. The wind is contrary, and it is wild. We're drowning, Lord. We're, we're lost. We're lost. We're dying. And hear what he said to them. And the boat is flooding at this time with waters. It was sinking. We're perishing, Lord. And he said to them, to what did you, And what did you hesitate? O oh, little of faith. What what did you doubt? And, and isn't it I who's in the boat with you? But it's flooding with waters. Am, am I not with you in the boat? For that reason, dear brethren, the vital point is not if, it's the, wa if the boat is flooded with water, but if Christ is in the boat. That is what the Word of God says. If only you heard me when I taught you, if only you had heeded me when I spoke to you towards what direction you should walk. Because your peace would have been like the river. The river runs, runs, runs and never ends. Where does it find this water? Have you seen a fountain? How the water comes out from a well? You say it will go dry. It doesn't go dry, ever. And it comes out and out and more and more. Where does it come from? Who fills this fountain with water and it pours out and out and never goes dry? It doesn't go dry. There is a cycle. The water goes down to the sea, it evaporates, it becomes clouds, it falls down like rain, then it fills up again and again the same. It's a circle, a circle. That's how the peace of the Christian is. Never goes dry. But drought may come. It doesn't drought then. It doesn't dry up then. Burning of the sun may come. It doesn't dry up. But it may not rain for three weeks. It doesn't go dry. For three months, it doesn't go dry. For three years, it doesn't go dry. That is what Christ wants to do in our life, brethren. The water may become less but it never dries up. And if the river that God fills doesn't go dry, will the peace that Christ gives, the Prince of Peace, go dry? Hallelujah, brethren. Dear, dear brethren, Christ wants to make such an injection in us of faith and hope today. Faith and hope. My hand has laid the foundation of the earth. Now, after he revealed the weakness of man, how easy he loses his faith, how easily he loses his boldness, how easily he loses his power and strength, how easily he is discouraged, how easily his heart becomes hard, how easily he is deceived, and how easily he backslides, how easily he goes astray. Then he comes and says, Come here and let me tell you something. I... I am the one who found to laid foundations of the earth upon which you walk. Is there anything more stable so you can stand on? If you're sailing on a boat, you're afraid of the storm. If you're flying in, in the sky, then you're afraid of the turbulence. If you get up into a high building, you're afraid. Will it fall or will it stand? And when there is danger, what do we do? We run down to earth. 
There's a blow. We run down to earth. Is there an earthquake? We run down to earth. Quickly. Up on the earth. The face of the earth. And God comes and says, You who run to earth because it is your safety, learn that I laid foundations of this earth. I founded it. Do you consider that it's very strong and stable and you have security on it? I am the one who laid foundations. You see the heavens that are very high. Who can reach up there, you say? They're very far away. They're big and infinite. Well, I am the one who made them. And I am the one who command them and they pass all before me. All heavens. And I, I raised my beloved Cyrus and through, and he will fulfill my will against Babylon and he will fulfill my will against the Chaldeans and yes, I raised him so he can deliver you. And if, dear brethren, the people of Israel was delivered from the Chaldeans and from Babylon by the hand of Cyrus, for us, dear brethren, God sent Christ, the Son, His only Son. And if the Lord, if Cyrus managed, because God gave him power and authority to be the ruler of the whole world, the world leader, to submit all the powers of the earth under his might, with the sole purpose of the people of Israel to be freed, then how much more, dear brethren, will Jesus Christ, who said, to me was given all authority in heaven and on earth, and behold, authority I give to you to step on scorpions and serpents and all the power of the enemy, and nothing will be able to harm you. How much more then? It's not that this is who we are. This is who we are, yes. We are small, insignificant, without any power. That is who the other man is also. And your husband and your wife and your children. And... Something, dear brethren, that is very serious. Of similar suffering we are all. Whatever the weakness of your husband is, is yours also. Whatever weakness your wife has, you also have that. Whatever weakness your children have, you also have. Whatever weakness your parents have, it's also yours. And whatever weakness of your brother is you also have that weakness. We are of similar suffering, brethren. But the difference, dear brethren, is based on this great secret. If only, oh, if you heeded my commandments, I teach you for your profit. I teach you the way which you should go. If only, you heard, he did my commandments. This is for our mistakes. But it is our, of the past. But it is also for our future. So we cannot make the same mistakes again. Let us say, without you, Christ, I cannot do anything. Whatever I've done alone, I have messed up. Whatever I have tried to do on my own, I have failed. Whatever I wanted, I never managed. One thing I desire now, for you to help me. Help me so I can fulfill and obey your word. Help me so your teaching can be for me doctrine of obedience. Help me so that your guidance can be for me a commandment. In other words, so I can obey completely and absolutely your word without leaving out anything. I want to walk and call directly on your guidance without any slipping left or right. Because I want your peace, dear Lord, in my life to be like a river. And I want your righteousness, my Christ, 
and my life to be like the waves of the sea. And I want my fruit to be a lot, so you can be glorified. Amen.